Welcome to the Great Detectives of Old Time Radio. From Boise, Idaho, this is your host, Adam Graham. If you have a comment, email it to me. Uh, Box13 at greatdetectives.net. Follow us on Twitter at Radio Detectives and become one of our friends on Facebook. Facebook.com slash Radio Detectives. Voting in the Podcast Award continues. Please vote for us in the Entertainment category at PodcastAwards.com. You can vote for us every day and I encourage you to do so. So vote every day. PodcastAwards.com. And also, I do want to let you know the program is brought to you in part by the financial support of our listeners. And in particular today, I want to thank Jennifer supporting us with a Patreon donation of $4 or more per month at the level of the Shamus level. You can support the show on a one-time basis, support.greatdetectives.net, or ongoing at patreon.greatdetectives.net. Well, this is it. This is the series everyone has been asking for for so long, and we're glad to bring you Richard Diamond. The series came to NBC April 24th of 1949, at a time when NBC uh, was beginning to rebuild after CBS's talent raids. And this was also a very key point for Dick Powell. In the early part of Powell's career, he was a song and dance man kind of uh, Frank Sinatra of the 30s. Made a lot of musical and comedy films, but didn't really get serious roles. That was until he landed the role of Philip Marlowe in Murder, My Sweet. And then throughout the middle and late 1940s, he got a lot of very uh, hard-boiled war type roles, some as uh, heroes, some as anti-heroes. And of course, he starred in Rogue's Gallery, the first true hard-boiled private eye uh, program. However, he uh, returned to a regular radio series in 1949 with something different. He had been offered and uh, did an audition for Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar on CBS, but that wasn't to be. Instead, he opted to do Richard Diamond, uh, a unique show which, to me, kind of marries both parts of uh, Powell's career. So, uh, without any, uh, let's go ahead and uh, get into today's episode. The original air date is April the 24th of 1949, and the title is The Richard Barton Case. Here's Dick Powell as Richard Diamond, private detective. <laughs> Oh, afternoon, Ed. Have a good lunch, Mr. Diamond? Too early to tell. Hey, you must shave with a dull razor. You got a scratch on your face. I use a rake. <laughs> Here's your floor, Mr. Diamond. Thanks, Ed. Well, customers. Good afternoon, gentlemen. What can I do for you? Oh. oh, that was nifty, Ziggy. Is that Diamond? Yeah, Chino. That's him. Pick him up and drag him over to the chair, Ziggy. Sure thing, Chino. <laughs> He's really out. Yeah. See if you can bring him around. Be a shame if he missed anything. Chino, would you mind holding my ass can handle? It might break his jaw. A pleasure, Ziggy. Diamond. Diamond. He looks like he ain't gonna make it. Maybe he slapped him too hard. You hurt me, Ziggy. You know how careful I am. Here. Try this pitcher of water. I felt like I was lying in the middle of a crowded sink and someone had piled all the dishes on my head. They turned on the faucet and I floated up with a dirty coffee cup and took a look around. I spread in water and squinted through my dewy eyelids with two of the ugliest dishwashers I'd ever seen. He's twitching. 
Oh. See, Ziggy, he's just lazy. Uh, Diamond, uh, let us know when things stop making sense. Oh, that's that's a dirty trick. Oh, he's talking screwy. What's a dirty trick, Diamond? Uh, I'm stuck in the drain. Uh, I think you hit him too hard. He's liable to be talking like that from now on. Give it time. Give it time. Uh, Diamond, you pull yourself out. Yeah. How did your monkeys get in here anyway? He's back. <laughs> Not go to work, Ziggy, but uh, keep him with it. Hey, wait a minute. Oh. 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 Uh, can you hear me, Diamond? Uh, he don't like it. It's going to be hard to get along with. Don't come across the ears. He'll listen. Hear me now? He's nodding his head. I guess he wants to keep his mouth shut so the teeth don't fall out. Fine. Now listen, Diamond. When you get a call from a Mr. Barton, turn down the job. Understand? Ziggy, see if he's tuned in. Oh. Yes, you know. He says now he's got a tour on. Remember, Mr. Barton, you don't want to work for him. Then get it. Sure, you know, but he looks tired from the strain. Oh. Then put him to sleep, Ziggy. Nighty-night time. He didn't have to say nighty-night. It was only two o'clock in the afternoon. He tapped me once more with a galvanized sleeping pill and tucked me away for a rest. The next thing I knew, a pair of gray suede gloves were patting my sore face. Maybe he didn't want to leave any fingerprints on my bruises. Mr. Diamond. Mr. Diamond, can you hear me? Oh. Oh, you know, this, this can get monotonous. Go away. Should I call the police, Mr. Diamond? What? Oh. Oh, I, I was expecting uglier company. Could you sit up? I'm getting some of your blood on my shoes. That's tough. I'll turn it off. How about your name's Barton? Why, that's right. How did you know? I'm lucky. Now get out of here. But I want to talk to you. I just had one long conversation, but it was too one-sided. Go on. My health is doubtful, but it's fun to have it around for company. Maybe $500 would pick you up? That might, for a while. But I don't like to waste that kind of money on funerals. Seven fifty. So they line the coffin with velvet. A thousand. Uh, you're begging to make a short life sound practical. If you do the job successfully, there'll be another thousand. You just bought yourself a corpse. Let me wash up. Talk some more. I can hear you. It's my son, Roger. He thinks he killed a man. He thinks. What do you want me to do? Find out for sure so he can brag about it? Ever heard of a John Alter? Sure. Walt Levinson sent him up five years ago on a manslaughter rap. Well, he doesn't like it up there, and he'd like to get out. I don't blame him. What's this got to do with your son? I'm chairman of the parole board. Oh, you look much better now, Mr. Diamond. I can't stand the sight of blood. It doesn't bother me. It happens every week. So, uh, you're the chairman of the parole board. Yes, some of Alter's friends promised to keep quiet about my son. If I let Alter go free when he comes up before the board next mm -hmm. week. Mm -hmm. And you think maybe your son was framed? Yes, about a month ago, he met a girl in Florida. Her name is Lenore Brown, and she's a friend of Alter's. How did they spring the frame? I beg your pardon? You must associate with a higher type thug. Spring the frame. Made it look like your son killed somebody. Oh, uh. Well, when Roger, that's my son, went to pick up the Lenore girl at her apartment, he found her struggling with some man. That happened. It looked like he was trying to kill her. There was a gun on the floor, and she called to Roger for help. He picked up the gun and shot the man. She told Roger he had killed him and that he must get out. When we went back, they were both gone. About a month later, some of Alter's friends got in touch with me. Oh, and they forget about the killing if you let Alter out of Sing Sing. That's right. I don't remember reading anything about it in the papers. Well, you're the first one outside of Alter and his friends who know anything about it. You see, they say they're hiding the corpus delecti so there was no report of the murder. Keeping a stiff handy isn't that easy. Why didn't you call the law? If my son did kill this man, that's the first thing I intend doing. But I have a feeling this man is not dead. Oh, you, uh, you think maybe they staged the killing? Put blanks in the gun and after your son beat it, the stiff walked out under his own steam? That's what I want you to find out. If my son is innocent... I want you to bring the parties responsible to justice. Amen. It's a check for a thousand dollars. If you find the girl and prove my son innocent, there'll be another thousand in your pocket. I'll sort the holes. Well, thanks, Mr. Barton. I'll start right away. Goodbye, Mr. Diamond. You can reach me at the Wentworth Hotel. I'm staying there until this matter gets cleared up. I won't get in touch with you unless I find something. The guys who worked me over are pretty set in their ways, and there's no sense in you tripping over a lot of dead bodies. <laughs> I 
looked at the thousand dollar check and thought about the beating the two polite gunsels had given me. This was a toss up. If I'd spent the thousand like I knew I would, I'd be dead anyway. The two goons were probably still hanging around my building, and if they spotted me, they'd guess I'd taken the job. When I get more than ten bucks in my pocket, I smile all over. I went out the back way and through the alley. I had to start somewhere, so I headed for the 5th Precinct Police Station. When you're looking for a killer, homicide, you got all the roadmaps on murder. An old friend and ex-partner was in charge. The men who worked at the tail called him Lieutenant Levinson, but he had a couple of friends who still called him Walt. I was one of them. You earn that right when you work for a guy for six years. After I left the force, Walt started doing a solo, but he now had a sergeant who stumbled around after him. His name was Otis, and he had the biggest seat in the state of New York. Every time he took off his shoes, I wanted to grab a champagne bottle and launch them. I don't think he liked me. When I walked in, his face always looked like an advertisement for a sour stomach. Well, Richard Diamond, private detective. Well, Sergeant Otis, homicide's answer to the missing link. What was that last word? Look, you're half safe. I said link. Walt in? Yeah. You turn the knob and you push. Why don't you get that uniform cleaned? Some dad's going to get up and walk to the station without you. Well, hello, Rick. If you got... Hmm. You get tired changing your face every day. Somebody shove you around again? Been catching up on my patty cake, Walt. Tell me, did you uh, ever know a bit of fluff named Lenore Brown? Sure, John Alder's expense account. Used to hold hands before I send him up. Know where I can find it? Alder's still got her staked out. And in the stir, he's going to come back and dig up the claim. You better forget about it. She's got the antidote for lonely nights, but some of Alder's boys are protecting it. I know, yeah. They gave me a pep talk this afternoon. Then listen to him. Better watch some games on the bench. Oh, you never can tell. I might make a score. Well, you're outweighed, outclassed, and that'll be outlived. She used to work at the Black Swan in Florida. Her daughter was trying to get a parole, and she came to New York to be close to him. Any line on her here in town? No, but if she's seeing older, you might spot her on a business day. And now, look, Rick, why don't you stop chasing two-bit thugs and come back on the force? I never had all this and you were working together. You know how I feel about that, Walt. I'm a restless guy. Sometimes I like to sleep late in the morning. Okay, Rick. Want me to call the warden and tell him you're coming? Yeah, thanks, Walt. Take it easy. Bye, Rick. Be a good boy. Yes, Paul? Mr. Richard Diamond to see you, Warden. Oh, send him in. You can go on in, Mr. Diamond. Thanks, Paul. Well, Rick, how are you? It's been a long time. I know a lot of guys who wouldn't like to hear that, Warden. How are you, Jim? Just great. What's on your mind? I hear Johnny Alter's been having company. I'd like to take a look at her. Oh, Miss Brown. Well, I can't blame you. I just want to spot her and see where she goes. You can't miss. If she walks through the yard, there'd be a jailbreak tomorrow. What time of visiting hours? Well, if she's seeing Alter today, she should be downstairs right now. Pardon me, Sidney. Yes, Warden. Paul, is Lenore Brown coming today? Yes, she has, Warden. She's in seeing Alter right now. Thanks, Paul. This is downstairs, Rick. Like to take a look? Yeah. I'll have Paul take you down. Mm-hmm. On second thought, I'll go myself. There she is. Sitting at the end table talking to Alda. Oh. Now I know why Alda needs a lot of money. She's wearing enough of mink to carpet Radio City. <laughs> you should get a load of her on a warm day. Coat doesn't stop me. She'd show up, even if she's wearing a tent. How long has she got with Alder? About another five minutes. Warden, maybe I'll let you put me away for a couple of years. Something like that to look forward to on Visitor's Day, I might go for the change. Well, you'd get tired of just talking. <laughs> Think what you could do on the outside. Yeah, I am, but it would probably send me right back up here. Well, you want to stick around until she's through talking? Thanks, Jim. I, I'll wait in front till she comes out. <laughs> the big gray buildings until she came out. She walked over to a long white convertible and got in. Now I know what the guy meant when he wrote. Ask the man who owns one. I decided to let her buy me a new fuse and I walked over to the car. Uh, going to town? Oh? Back up three feet and I'll let you know. Okay? Mm-hmm. Your tailor couldn't do all of that. Fine. Get in.
Busy. Yeah, yeah. The warden's no friend. How many years did you know him? Uh-uh, uh-uh, baby. I've been going home every night all my life. Every night? Well, mm, almost. What do you do with the almost? Depends. Everybody likes something different. You must get tired because they have new ideas. Oh, I don't think much. It's more fun being surprised. What are you stopping for? We just got started. Surprise? Oh, yeah. And the nickel-plated one. Look, baby, you don't have to pull a gun. If I'm getting fresh, I'll get out and walk. You sit right there, Diamond. Oh, name dropper. Mm-hmm. Expecting company? Mm-hmm, and you've met them before. That's nice. I wouldn't want you to get stuck with the introduction. That's your friends coming along in that car? It should be. Now hold real still. And I'm going to shoot you this time. Sometimes you're lucky. When the dame's got a gun on you. You don't stand much of a chance unless she's got her mind on something else. This one did. And when she looked up in the rearview mirror to make sure it was her boy, I tagged her. My two playmates were just sitting up in the green sedan when I went out of the car like a dry transmission. He let go just as I dived off the side of the road and hit the center embankment. I rolled to the bottom and came up looking like an exhibit for smallpox. He's down the hill. Go get him, Ziggy. There was a line of trees just off to the right, and I got to them just as Ziggy tried again. He needed a rifle. I was running through the trees then, and I could hear Ziggy somewhere behind me falling all over himself. I pulled my gun and thought about waiting for him. I could give him so many holes he'd whistle in a high wind, but I had another idea. I stopped and listened. He's around here somewhere. Well, come on, we'll spread out. That toy's right down the middle. They were somewhere behind me, and both of them were looking. Me a million hands off. I got on a new suit. Huh? Oh, my goodness, the college is Tina. I thought you was diamond. Can't you tell a difference, Ziggy? He's got on a blue suit. Oh, I'm a little colorblind. Uh, now let's find diamond. They started hunting again, and I cut off to my left and headed back to the highway. I reached the hill that sloped down from the highway, and I went up fast. The cars were about a hundred yards down the road, and I used my last lung getting there. But no, it was still out, just like I'd left it when I put her to sleep. I went over to the Gunsel's car and lifted the hood. Chino and Ziggy could apologize all night while they looked for a new distributor. I went back to the white convertible with the unconscious nylons and got in. I noticed something lying on the seat. It was her purse, and she didn't wake up when I grabbed it. Doing a rummage job at 80 miles an hour isn't easy. But there wasn't much of interest anyway, just a little black book. I needed a gimmick, so I stuck it in my pocket. I put the purse back on the seat just as she started coming around. Oh. Ah, now that's it, baby. Sit up and look at the pretty scenery. How did you get here? Where's you been to? Playing Peter Pan. Hmm. Did you all hurt? Yes, you do. Play her off and you get hurt. Where do I take you? Uh, my apartment, I guess. They're going to ask a lot of questions, and I don't talk much. You might as well figure out something to fill in the room. I drove to her place on East 51st and walked it to the door. She looked at me like a fat woman eyeing a French pastry, and her mouth slipped down to her shoelaces when I gave her a peck on the cheek and left her standing with an old front doorknob in her hand. I knew she wasn't going to spill anything, even if I got her drunk. Besides, she could probably drink Tony Galeno under the table and still be sober enough to play hopscotch. I went back to the office and took out a little black book. There were a lot of names, and some of them I knew. Chino. And after it, likes his work. And Ziggy. And after his name, has own gun. And yeah, yeah. Richard Diamond, too. I never did figure out what the three stars were for. I'd forgotten all about my date with Helen when the phone rang. Yeah? Hello, Rich. Oh, up to... No, uh, this is Fong Wu, Fong Wu, Chop Choy, Pai Ra. Now, Fong Wu, call Mr. Richard Diamond at the phone, Chop Chop. He's got a date and she doesn't like being stood up. Hello, Helen. Hi. What was all that about? Did I forget you had a date with me? Yeah, yeah, I did. And I'm sorry, baby, but right now I, I'm being chased like a hopped-up fox. I haven't had time to curl up and relax. You're impossible. I know it, I know it. Hmm. Won't your sorority pen back? Well... I'll make up my mind when you get here. I'll give you my Lone Ranger magic decoder. You fool. <laughs> Are you still going steady? Oh. 
Rick, what am I going to do? Oh, honey, I don't. I got some reading to do. Why don't you go to a movie? Little women pass the senses. I'll be over later. I'll probably end up marrying an usher. Don't be too late, Rick. I won't. Besides, we get along better early in the morning. Bye. Bye, baby. I sat there for a minute thinking about Helen Asher, wondering why I hadn't learned how to butter my bread. She was everything a guy should want. Ten million dollars playing multiplication in a fat trust fund. A figure that would snarl at any quiet intersection. And a mind that would give a master's degree in inferiority complex. Diamond, you fool, you. Well, Lenore Brown's little black book was a poor substitute for an evening with Helen, but three items put me in second gear. They weren't hard to find. Take out all the men's names, and there they were. Three addresses. One was in the village, another in Harlem, and the last was somewhere in Chinatown. All of them were set up for a dead man who wanted to make himself scarce. I wanted to talk with Barton before I started hunting, so I called the Wentworth. <laughs> Walked out, got back in the cab, and marked off Greenwich Village in the little black book. The second address was on the fringe of Harlem, the hill, they call it. The night was black, and the fog had rolled in off the East River and staked out a claim all the way to Lenox Avenue. As I walked up to the old brownstone, my nerves started screaming SOS. I stopped cold and looked down at two gleaming eyes, like two pieces of polished glass shining in the glare of the dim street lamp. As I got used to the darkness, I could make him out. He was a big, white, battle-scarred bulldog. And he had some ideas of his own. He started shuffling in slowly, jerking back his lips and showing a row of white teeth. Hold it, Lucifer. I hadn't heard him come out on the porch. He was a big man wearing an off-white undershirt. And from what I could see, he looked meaner than his dog. The animal stopped, but he kept facing me, showing off his toothpaste smile. You won't hurt you, mister. Unless I tell him to. I'll think about it for a while. I'm a poor substitute for horse meat. What do you want? Do you know Lenore Brown? You a cop? Shamus. Beat it, Lucifer. Oh! <laughs> Thanks, pal. I couldn't hold my breath much longer. You can come up on the porch. You're looking for Lenore Brown, huh? Yeah, I know her. I met her. My wife works for her. Is your wife in? Yeah. Yes, sir. Come here. Some private dick wants to talk to you. She's Miss Brown's private maid. Yeah. Your husband tells me you work for Miss Brown. Yeah, what's she done? She got many friends? Many friends. Yeah. You know a dark man with a scar? Oh, sure. I know lots of them. What are you talking about, woman? Oh, I, uh, I met someone who Miss Brown knows. What did you mean by that, Miss Brown? Look, I really don't know anybody with a scar. Now you better be. Yeah. Get moving. I want to talk to you, woman. Here you I knew she was going to get bruised, but he looked rough enough to cut my windpipe, and I wanted someplace to pour my coffee down in the morning. So I got out of there fast and headed for the last address in the little black book. The place was on one of those narrow, dark streets. It was so quiet you could hear yourself change your mind. A sign above the door read Tangy, so I pushed it open and went in. If I didn't find a man with a scar here, I was out on strike. It was a little restaurant on the bottom floor of a two-story building. A quiet waiter slipped up and showed me to a booth. He shoved the menu in my hand and disappeared before I could ask him anything. The place was empty except for an old couple sitting near the door. The waiter said something to them and they looked quickly over at me. And then they left in a hurry. The room was completely empty now. Even the waiter had disappeared. I looked up at a flight of stairs at the far end of the room. A pair of very healthy ankles came into view. And they were holding up a pair of legs that ran my blood pressure up to 190 again. I eased my gun out and held it under the table. Lenore turned the corner and started down toward my booth like a loose snake in a rabbit pen. Mind if I sit down? Uh, it's your party. Shame on you. Don't you know it's not nice to pill for a lady's handbag? Now, Mama will have to stop. Looks like the last address paid off. If you're buying shrouds, it did. Where's the guy that young Barton was supposed to have killed? Upstairs. But he's very unsociable. Keep long conversation. I only need a couple of lines. He can't even do that. 
He likes to keep on brooding. Old man Barton figures Alter framed his son. He's not going to let your boyfriend out of Sing Sing until he finds a man with a scar. Think he can do better than you did? Uh, I found him. Was it worth dying for? I don't know. I can tell you better after I talk to him. Mama's going to have to stand sooner than she expected. Come in, boys. Well, look who's here. Are Mama's two big idiots out collecting blood again? Where are your buckets? Oh, he's there. Present! You've, um, you've met Chino and Ziggy before, haven't you? Yeah, on the end of a fist. They want to show you the town. I know the beat. I'll bet you've never seen it from the bottom of the East River. No, but if you'll put on a bathing suit, I might buy the idea. Uh, too bad we'll never make the beach together. I'd like to show you the sight. Boys, you better help Mr. Diamond out of the booth. I think he's fat. You know how it is. The boys like to keep moving. So do I. I, know. I shot once and caught Ziggy in the stomach, and I dumped the table over on Chino. Oh. He grabbed like he was going to waltz with it. I didn't even have to get up. I just shot him through the cover shot. Oh. Lenore was out of the booth fast and running for the stairs. I caught up with her at the foot of the stairs, and as she started up, I saw him standing on the upper landing, scar and all, all meaning gun in his hand. He missed me, but nailed her halfway up. She spun around and fell all over me. But I pointed a gun pretty good from the prone position. You should have kept your nose up, mister. A bad landing washes you out. I called Lieutenant Robinson, squared myself. Then homicide came down and cleaned things up. They were all dead, and I figured I never would reach the beach anyway. I phoned Barton, who took his son down to the morgue to look over the night's tape. Young Barton identified the man with the scars, the one he thought he'd killed. They gave me the notch, and I made another call. This time to a pair of silk pajamas with an understanding heart. It was late, but I was hungry. Oh, good morning, Mr. Diamond. Isn't it rather late to be calling? You know something? You're right, Francis. It's 2 a.m. Time for all good butlers to be betty by. Miss Helen is in the library, but I'm not sure whether she wants to see you. Well, you just run along and get some sleep. I'll find out and let you know. Very good, sir. Confidentially, she's a bit confused. Look. Clean up, Mr. Diamond. Francis, if she gets tough with me, I'll knock her teeth out. Oh, my goodness. Oh, my goodness. Francis, is that who I think it was? Oh. Hi. The food was cold a long time ago. So was my date. I'm sorry, honey. Oh, that's all right. The fire's almost burned down. It's two o'clock in the morning, Mr. Diamond. I sat through two features of Tom and Jerry in the fourth chapter of Batman Hot the Ah, come on, don't scold, lady. I haven't been mute, but I've been missing this for the past two hours, and you're going to listen. Uh, that's another thing. You never came when I wanted to. Or even when I got you on the carpet. That sounds like fun. I'll stop doing it. If you think the one minute you keep coming, I'll tell you the face of the sunshine. Put on a great big smile. Now stop that and listen to me. Okay, okay, I'll shut up. Well, go on. You Now you made me forget what I was going to say. <laughs> you can't remember, honey. Hold a good thought. It's a big, wide, wonderful to live in. When you're in love, you're a master. Of all you today, you're a gay Santa Claus. I just remembered. Too late now, honey, I'm rolling. There's a brave new star-spangled sky above you. When you're in love, you're a fool. I'm a hollow with a big heart. I'm a hollow with a big heart. Diamond, starring Dick Powell, was previously released over the National Broadcasting Company for listeners in the United States, and has been re-released to you men and women overseas by the United States Armed Forces Radio Service, the voice of information and education. Hi, 
this is Andrew from otrwesterns.com. I wanted to invite you to come take a look at our site. We stream live OTR Westerns 24 hours a day, 7 days a week, along with putting out podcasts of old-time radio westerns. Check us out at otrwesterns.com. You're listening to The Great Detectives of Old-Time Radio with Adam Graham. Now let's get back into the show. Welcome back. Well, this is a good first episode for setting up the uh, concept, including Diamond's previous service on the Force. And uh, to me, what it also sets up is the really unique thing about this series. Because if you take your traditional hard-boiled detective show, you know, your Philip Marlowe's and your Sam Spades, you get uh, violence kind of like what you had in, in today's episode of Richard Diamond. In fact, the violence, the investigation, and the style of that, that's all true to what you'll uh, hear in hard-boiled private eye shows. However, the romantic part and the singing part that's really unique. That's the type of thing you would expect in something that was much more of a detective comedy. So you essentially have this mixture of uh, a couple different genres here. Uh, two very different story uh, approaches. The hard-boiled private eye and the uh, relaxing um, romantic comedy kind of uh, coexisting within the same program. It's a very unique mixture, and I don't know if any series other than Richard Diamond could have done it. So uh, I hope you've enjoyed the premiere, and uh, we've got about two years of this, so uh, uh, we've got many more months ahead with uh, Richard Diamond. All right, that will actually do it for today. Join us back here tomorrow, Boston Blackie. And then next Wednesday, another episode of Richard Diamond. In the meantime, send your comments to box13 at greatdetectives.net. Follow us on Twitter at Radio Detective.